education. Today, what I want to talk about is this very, very simple idea, the what, the why, and the how of second language listening. What I plan to do is to provide an overview, uh, the big picture of listening. And maybe I will talk a little bit about online, uh, you know, listening uh, lessons. But I think my colleague from UM, uh, Ibu Ifon, Maria Ifon Francisca, Francisca Maria Ifon, uh, is going to spend a bit more time uh, sharing her expertise in the area of, uh, you know, uh, technology and how technology can be used for teaching language and in particular for teaching listening. Let me start by asking you a very big, a very broad question. Remember, my topic today is on listening in a second language, listening in English in particular. What I have here are four different skills, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Which one do you think is the most important or the most difficult for you, but in particular for students who are still learning uh, to speak the language, who are st still learning to develop their English language proficiency, uh, wherever they are, maybe in Indonesia, uh, in Malaysia, or in many other places. Listening, speaking, reading, or writing. Perhaps for beginners, you would probably say that all the four skills are equally difficult. But my experience is that listening seems to be rather difficult compared to the other skills. Now remember, I used to go to China to recruit teachers to come to study uh, in Singapore on the Chinese government scholarship uh, and also on the Singapore government scholarship. We interviewed the, uh, uh, the uh, candidates and we also gave them a number of tests actually, including speaking tests, listening tests, reading tests and writing tests. Now, these are very, very experienced English language teachers. Now, which one do you think they scored the lowest on the test? Interestingly, they seem to be okay when it comes to speaking. They seem to be okay when it comes to reading. Actually, their reading is very good. Uh, they're also quite good in terms of writing. It is the listening that continues to be very, very challenging for many, many teachers in China. I would think, I would say that the same thing also happens in other places like Indonesia. Listening seems to be difficult, but at the same time, in today's session, I'm going to say that listening is also one of the most important skills. Now, if I were to ask you this question, again, another very important question for us to consider from a language learning perspective, which one is more important? And from a language using perspective, which of the four skills is the most important? Bulafti, do you want to answer this question? Let me repeat one more time. From a language learning perspective, process belajar, dalam rangka belajar bahasa Inggris, which of the four skills is the most important? And from the uh, using language using perspective, which one or which one is the most uh, you know important? Very quick, we left it. Okay, One sh short answer. Yes, sir. From acquisition, I think listening. Listening first. And one hundred percent agree with you. Yes. And the other one. Yes. Okay. Yes. I think. I think. I before the session started, I gave you the answers. Yeah. Did I? Yes, I did. <laughs> yes. From a language learning perspective, these two, listening and reading, are more important than speaking and writing. It's not that speaking and writing are not, not important when the students are still uh, in the process of learning a language, but listening and reading are probably more important, are probably more useful. If your students are not able to speak and write, maybe they have not done enough listening, maybe they have not done enough reading. From a language using perspective, <clears throat> I think we will also agree that speaking and writing are probably considered to be more valuable skills. When you walk on the street in a foreign country, people do not approach you and ask, do you read English? But people will ask you, do you speak English? So speaking is very often a very valued skill when it comes to using the language. If you apply for a job in a company, for example, 
uh, that requires you to do a lot of writing, a lot of report, for example, then uh, the interviewers will ask you, can you write in good English? Can you write uh, you know, a report that is easy to understand, that makes people you know, happy with the uh, results of the report, for example? Again, uh, today, what I want to do is to share with you three very important ideas. The first one is what is actually listening? I'm sorry, I'm looking at my... What is, what is listening and why is it important and how to go about teaching it? Boeka, can you let me know when I have, speak, uh, I have spoken for about 30, 35 minutes? Please let me know, yeah? Yes, I will. Okay. First off, what is listening? I'm going to get a little bit technical. I think this is extremely important if you teach language. If you teach reading or listening, then an understanding of the mental process of somebody arriving at comprehension, I think is particularly important. There are three stages. There are three important things that we need to pay attention to. The first step in the process is called perception, perceiving. Uh, in the case of reading, it's seeing. In the case of listening, it's hearing. Can you hear correctly, basically? Yeah, can you identify the sound? Is Bulefti speaking English or speaking Javanese or speaking French? Hearing, yeah, that's the first step. But hearing the sound only is not enough. I think the next step is for you to be able to make use of your language knowledge in order for you to be able to break the stream of sounds into meaningful units. And this is called parsing. This is a technical language. You don't, you don't have to remember this after you know, the session is over. Perception, hearing, and then parsing, also known as chunking. Now, this requires a bit of knowledge of the grammar of the language, how the grammar works. What is the uh, word order, for example? What is a phrase like? What is a sentence like in the language that you're learning? So parsing is important. But the third bit is utilization. Now, utilization is how you can make use of your knowledge, what you already know, you know, your experiences, your knowledge about culture, your knowledge about certain topics in order for you to be able to bring meaning into what you're listening to into the text. So these are three things that I want to go through very, very briefly. Yeah. Perception, hearing seems like a very, very simple thing. But a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of incomprehension, a lot of the problems that the students have with listening can be traced to their ability or their lack of ability in perceiving the sound, the spoken language. Yeah, the first part is the sound, being able to recognize the sounds, being able to distinguish between t and th, for example, which are two different sounds in the English language, between f and p, for example. Yeah, ma up, then ma af, two different you know, uh, sound, although in Indonesia, in Bahasa Indonesia, both mean the same thing, but in the English language, it's different. Yeah, whether you say puff or pop, these are two different words, very, very different. So being able to discriminate, to distinguish different sounds in a language, whether it's Javanese, whether it's German, whether it's Japanese or English. The second sound. Now this one also can be a source of difficulty for our students, sound blending. When you say a single sound individually, it's very clear. T, b. When you say a word individually, it may be very clear as well. Mary. Sudden. One word very clearly. But when words are used together, and that is when students may encounter difficulty. And English is notorious. English is extremely difficult when it comes to this. Of course, for native speakers, this is not a problem, but for non-native speakers, this can be a great source of problem. Look at it. What did I say? Sianna, what did I just say? Look at it. What did I say just now? Difficult, isn't it? 
It's about sound blending. Yeah. Yes. It's difficult. Well, it's yes. more complex. Yes. Here's an example. What I what I just said. Can you tell me what I am going to say now? Look at it. Look at it. Yes. Look at it. For you, it's very easy because you have developed a very high level of proficiency in the English language. But for Mahasiswa, for students who are learning English, that can be very, very challenging. Is look at it one word? Is look at it three words? They blend together. They merge together. The sounds like bercampur, baur, berasimilasi, sedemikian rupa. Very difficult to catch in the English language, yeah? And because of that, students may not be able to distinguish the boundary between words. Batas, batasnya tidak kelihatan. It's very blurry. For example, the word went in. Well, the lady eventually decided to went in. Uh, uh, he, you know, she went in and uh, then sat at the back of the classroom. She went in. Is it when, went in? Is that a word or is it went and in? So this is another uh, problem that students often uh, encounter. Accent, also another source of difficulty for students. They seem to have no difficulty understanding you because they because because they are very familiar with your accent, the color of your of your of your speech. But they may have difficulty understanding somebody from maybe from Malaysia, maybe from Singapore, maybe from the Philippines, or maybe from Japan or maybe from Australia or from other places in the world. Finally, speed. Another very, very important dimension in listening. Speed. Speed is something that you cannot control. You can ask a speaker to slow down. Please slow down, slow down. You're speaking too fast. And, this, and then the speaker will tell you, no, 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 I'm not speaking too fast. You are listening too slow. That's what is happening. Yeah, it's not, you know, it's not within our control. And because of that, it can be very, very challenging for students. Passing, okay, very briefly, passing has to do with your knowledge of the grammar of the language. Yeah, now, now if you have sufficient knowledge of the language, you may be able to group words. And uh, if you have a good knowledge of the language, you may be able to deal with sentence length. Short sentence, not a problem. Longer sentences, also not a problem. Also with sentence complexity, uh, when, 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 when you hear somebody using embedded clauses, for example, are you able to segment, to chunk the uh, phrases or the clauses into meaningful units? So this part actually is not really difficult. For most of our students, the most difficult will be the, uh, the uh, perception bit. Yeah. Have I mentioned about utilization? Ah, okay, just very briefly, utilization uh, is the extent to which our students have sufficient content knowledge so that they can make sense, that they can make a connection to uh, what is presented in the spoken discourse or in the spoken text. Again, what are the main sources of listening problems? I think you have a lot of experience. I think you know that your students have difficulty in listening, but what does research tell us about the main sources of listening problems? Oops, sorry. Sorry, I think I skipped, uh, I skipped this part, yeah? But let me just uh, very briefly talk about the uh, utilization stage. Utilization refers to the extent to which students have sufficient topical knowledge, enough cultural knowledge, if the uh, listening uh, topic uh, happens to be, you know, talking about the certain culture in Japan, for example, if they are not familiar with that, then they may have difficulty. Genre knowledge, different text types, whether it's a, it's, it's a, it's a formal conversation, whether it's a lecture, uh, different types of spoken language can also uh, cause some difficulty. And finally, experience in listening, whether or not students have had sufficient experience doing a lot of listening uh, in the classroom and also outside the classroom. Let me go back here. What are then the main sources of listening difficulty? What does research tell us? Now, here is one. It's a very interesting book from uh, John Phil, published some years back. Cambridge University Press. And 
after researching, after doing a lot of observations, after talking to teachers from different places, especially teachers teaching English as a foreign language, he comes to this conclusion. Let me read this to you. A disturbingly large number of larger scale problems of understanding actually have their origins in small scale errors of word recognition. Now, this sentence is very difficult to read actually and to understand. What he means is that when your students have listening comprehension problem, the main source of that problem is the, the uh, perception. They are not able to perceive the sound. They are not able to recognize the words that they are listening to. That's what he is saying, basically. Yeah. Any evidence for that? Yes. Now, here is a study that was done some years back by uh, one of our PhD students who was interested in understanding the kind of listening problems that Chinese uh, EFL students have. 10 or top 10 listening problems are shown in the graph. Yeah, number one, speaking rate, speed. Number two, if the speed is too fast, students get distracted. They cannot focus, they cannot concentrate. Problem number three, word recognition. Very interesting. Now, this is something which, is, which we need to realize. Students may know the word. They may be able to tell you what the word means when they see Kalodiliat. But when they hear, they can't. They can't hear the words. They can't recognize the words. New vocabulary. Yeah. And then missing subsequent input. That means because you're thinking too much when you're listening to the first sentence, you get distracted because you don't understand. The speaker is speaking too fast. And because of that, you miss the subsequent sentences. That's what it means. And when that happens, you become very nervous, panicky. Yeah. And there are some other uh, problems that the students mention. Now, if you look at this, the first five, top five listening problems, two things. Number one, speaking too fast, which you can't control. And number two, because of that, you can't catch the words. The words are just running too fast for you and you can't uh, catch the word quickly enough for you to understand. And this is uh, very much confirmed by some empirical studies that look at uh, you know, students' problems in terms of perception, passing and utilization. Uh, and this is the result of that particular study. Again, the students in question uh, are international students or EFL students from China. If you look at it very briefly, yeah, in terms of the number of words listed in each column, I think you can tell very quickly that students' problems are often related to perception. Yeah, the first one is perception, uh, a little bit of passing and a little bit of utilization, but mostly a uh, perception problem. Here are some uh, again, reports from research that I've seen about the students, you know, explaining why listening is difficult uh, for them. Speed, if the speed is too fast, I will not be able to remember the information. Now, this is a very important piece of information for us teachers. What should we do? What should we do, Ibusiana? Because students complain the speed is too fast, what, what would you tell your students to do? Hey, you have to listen faster. That's how you do it. Will that work? Listen faster? No, it won't work, actually. You have to do something to help your students to support their, uh, you know, their listening, uh, their process of learning how to listen. It's another thing, sometimes when the speed is too fast, when the speaker speaks too fast, I often feel uh, confused. Here's another one. Another one, vocabulary. Yeah, this is a real problem that you have to deal with. And later we'll talk about some, you know, how we can help our students to uh, develop uh, knowledge of vocabulary. I have a very small vocabulary. Now this boy is very smart, actually. I think this is something that I would also say to a lot of teachers. Actually, I think learning English, the grammatical rules seldom change. Now, that is a very, very interesting observation because many, many of us pay too much attention to grammar and not enough attention to vocabulary. 
And this student tells you very clearly, the grammar seldom changes. From junior middle school to grade one of high school SMR, we can cover nearly all the English grammatical rules. The rest is about building up my vocabulary and in particular, my listening vocabulary. Yeah. If I come across one new word, I often get stuck and I cannot catch the rest of the uh, utterances, if you like. Teachers also say the same thing. Vocabulary is a major area of difficulty. Now, the teacher is telling us very, very important insight. Students may know the words when they see the words, but they may not be able to recognize the words when they listen to it. So your job is to you know, train your students in understanding spoken vocabulary or listening vocabulary. Now, here is a big study, very, very interesting but very complex for undergraduate students. Uh, this is something that maybe Busiana want to look at at some point. It's a, it's, a, it's a high level kind of study, a PhD level kind of study. And the uh, author, the researcher is interested in understanding the uh, different variables, different factors that influence listening. And if, if you've been teaching for a while, I think you know that there are many factors that can influence, that can affect students' ability to comprehend spoken language. Yeah. Some teachers may be thinking that, hey, students don't understand because they do not know how to use appropriate strategies, listening, uh, co uh, you know, cognitive or metacognitive strategies. Some of you may be thinking that, hey, students don't understand because they don't have sufficient topical knowledge about what they are listening to. And because of that, their comprehension is not wonderful. And some of you may say that, hey, it's no, no, it's vocabulary. Now, what does this very complex study tell us? The study, again, is trying to find the relationship between all these many variables and listening. Very interesting. The results show very clearly that, yes, many of these variables have uh, related to uh, listening comprehension problem, but the most important and the most important variable that has the most direct relationship with listening, yang merah itu, vocabulary. So again, this points very clearly to you know to 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 what we need to do in the classroom when we need to when we want to help our students to develop their listening uh, ability. If you look at the research literature. It's very interesting, yeah. Years, maybe 10 or 20 years of research into the nature of listening. Researchers usually acknowledge that lower level processes like speed, vocabulary, word recognition, and so, and so on and so forth are important. But interesting, interestingly, the majority, the majority of research into L2 listening has focused on higher level processes. Now, higher level processes have to do with critical listening, for example, uh, students lacking sufficient uh, cognitive processing skill like inferencing, uh, not being able to use strategies and things like that. Very, very interesting. When we all know that students' problems can be traced mostly to their problems in perceiving uh, the, uh, the language, the spoken language, yeah. Okay, that's the first one. I hope we have a big picture, a big understanding of what listening is all about. Uh, what is the process of listening, which, you know, people believe involves three major sta stages, perception, processing, and utilization. And also we agree, I agree, that most of the problems that the students have are related to their inability uh, to process the spoken language at the perception level in particular. The other two levels are important too, but in particular at the perception level. Okay, point number one is why listening is important. I think this is very, very important too. If you're a teacher, then you need to understand why listening is important. Yeah, and this will give you motivation in terms of how much time or in terms of how little time you want to spend teaching your students this very important skill of listening. How much, you know, uh, time is given in the curriculum in developing your student's listening ability. Uh, 
as I said earlier on, uh, listening was not widely researched in comparison to reading, for example, in comparison to speaking and in comparison to writing as well. Uh, listening as a topic area of research within second language acquisition is often considered a Cinderella skill. Yeah, it's there, but it's not that important, which I think is greatly mistaken. Now, here are some of the reasons why teachers tend to avoid the teaching of uh, listening. It's not a sexy skill. What do you do in a listening classroom? You turn on the tape, or you turn on the CD player, or you turn on the audio, and then ask the students to listen, and then, you know, that's all there is to it. Not very sexy. It's not communicative, they say. It's often perceived to be not very important. L1 listening research is also not very common. L1 listening research usually has to do with listening in the real world, you know, empathetic listening, uh, listening for, I don't know, uh, as a counselor, you need to develop that listening skill so that you understand what psychological problems people have uh, in their life. It's a different kind of listening, but very rare uh, for us to uh, find the uh, research literature on L1 listening in relation to language acquisition. L1 reading research, huge body of literature, hundreds if not thousands of research studies on L1 reading. The same thing with L L2 reading, it's a lot. Also in our curriculum, I think we tend to put heavier emphasis on written literacy and not so much on oral literacy. In Singapore, it's only recently that school teachers pay more attention to oracy, the ability to understand language and the ability to speak or to use the language for oral communication. In the past, it's mostly on reading and writing. <clears throat> research, however, tells us, second language acquisition research tells us that listening is a main source of language input. One of the most important sources of language input is through listening. The other one is through reading. Two, and one of which is listening. And I will say a bit more about the importance of input in listening a bit later. If you can't listen, if you, if you can't listen very well, chances are you won't be able to speak very well. Yeah, that is another thing that I've learned from years of, and years of looking at the literature and also reflecting on my own experience. Point number three is also very important. Many teachers tend to give a lot more pronunciation practice, drill, 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 forgetting that the ability to pronounce actually comes from your ability to listen accurately to the language. So that will be the first step you need to do. If you want to improve on your students' pronunciation, they have to listen more. They have to pay more attention to what they are listening to. So that at some point, they, should, they will also be able to speak as accurately. Maybe not as, you know, as, as naturally, but as accurately and as comfortably uh, as well. So, question for you. I think we have the answers here, but I want to hear you say this again. Which one is more important, learning to talk or learning to listen? Yes, Yana, turn on your microphone again. From a second language acquisition perspective, which one is more important, learning to talk or learning to speak? Learning to listen. Learning to listen. And that's why uh, mothers usually know this very well. They will not let the baby speak when the baby is still one month old. The mom will keep on talking to the baby, speaking to the baby, using the same words again and again. After one year, the baby begins to, to say the words. And usually the first word, what is the first word? Mom. 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 Why mom? <laughs> Why mom, mom? Why not mango, for example? Why mom? Because he likes to talk to the baby. Yes, because the baby, because the mom says mom, mom, mom. 
all the time. So naturally, the baby will hear the words very frequently and then begin to speak and using the same words that the mother actually used. Now, here's another quote yeah, from research again, very, very interesting. James Nod, uh, he's not that well known in the uh, L2 research literature, but I like uh, what he wrote in one of his uh, papers. Some people now believe that learning a language is not just learning to talk, but rather that learning a language is building a map of meaning in the mind, a map of meaning in the mind. And we'll, we're going to explore this you know, a bit later, building a map of meaning in their mind. Now, these people believe that talking or speaking indicate that the language was learned. But they do not believe that practice in talking is the best way to build up this cognitive map in the mind. So one thing that we know here, something to take away today is this. Yeah, speaking is the result. Talking is the result. Akibat dari. Yeah, if you want, if you truly, truly want to help your students to improve on their speaking, then you need to do what you need to do is to provide a lot of opportunities for your students to listen, to build that cognitive map in their mind. Harus mencari sebabnya dulu, and we start from the sebab, and not from the akibat. I think we we get it all wrong when we you know give students a lot more practice in speaking. Speaking is so important, so we need to give them more practice. Yes, I agree, but that comes a bit later after the students have reached a certain level of proficiency, after students have already uh, had this, you know, foundation called the cognitive map, map uh, in the mind. The question is how? How do you build this cognitive map? The answer is by listening. Yeah. And here is, here is what I have in mind. By giving students a lot of listening practice, by giving students a lot of meaningful listening practice, real listening practice, yeah? Or what I call input-based practice. Now, two things to keep in mind. Now, this listening materials will have to be easy. The easier, the better. When the students listen and understand fully 100%, that is even better. And point number two, the students will need to listen daily, every day, maybe 15 minutes a day, maybe half an hour a day for one whole year. And if they do that, I think within one year, they'll be able to, yeah, to build that cognitive map in their head. Or we may call this the linguistic system. Now, this cognitive map, what does it look like? If I can open my head and examine what is inside in terms of my linguistic uh, system or cognitive map that I have in my head, you'll find that it's very complex. There's a lot of things in there. But one of the most important things that we have in our head that enables us to use the language, to speak the language, to understand is this. Not bits and pieces of language. No. I think we need some of this bits and pieces they are okay but the amount will have to be small but most of it will have to be this fixed phrases formulate expressions or also known as ready-made language or ready to use language if you like and what are these what are these ready to use language here we have lots of example uh, ibu mutiara please read one of them two of them two or three of them very quickly can't think of anything right now yes you really mean that yes can't think of anything right now hey what do you think about this Ibuziana? i'm sorry i can't think of anything right now there you go Jawabannya langsung keluar begitu. yeah i'm eating something and somebody walks by maybe my daughter my wife i'll say hey what about no dikit gitu ya uh if you're having fun you know uh having a conversation with Ibu Lefty over dinner and would Lefty say oh, it's getting late and, and 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 probably I'll say please don't go please don't go you know stay on stay for a few more minutes and things like that so these are ready made language and also ready to use language and that is what 
we know that we have in our head as a result of doing a lot of listening and also as a result of doing a lot of reading as well. So reading is input, listening is also input. Now here are some other examples of ready-made language. Again, research tells us very clearly that competent speakers, fluent users of the language have built or have, you know, have hundreds, if not thousands of these phrases in their head. Don't leave me alone. I'm sorry, Mutiara, it won't happen again. I promise, I promise, I promise it won't happen again. I will never, never break your heart again. Itu kan dulu pacarnya begitu kan, kalau janji, I will never, never break your heart again. Kan baru tiga kali, masa mau empat kali, break your heart, kan gitu. But these are words and phrases that just come to mind just like that. Yeah. Is this something that you can learn in the classroom? The answer is probably not. Probably not. You can learn some of them, but not most of them. Much less all of them. Tidak mungkin. Uh, excuse me, Pak Willy, it yes. has been 30 minutes. Yes, I need another 30 minutes, Ibu. See, <laughs> <No>. yes. <laughs> another 10 minutes and I'm done. Yeah. Again, from research, we know that this are uh, these ready-made languages, ready-made you know, phrases and sentences and utterances are acquired as whole, as whole units. Tidak dipotong-potong, tidak dipisah-pisah. They are not learned as bits and pieces of the language. They are learned as whole. Now, ini yang dinamakan grammar. This is what I call, or what people call, the early grammar, that knowledge that we have in our head. Itu seperti itu. Later, along the way, as the child grows older, as the students become more proficient, they are more able to split, to divide them up into meaningful segments of the language. And that is what I call the more mature grammar. And most of us in the audience, I think we have this, the first one and the second one. Now, if you're a language teacher, then of course, you know how to split the sentence into phrases, into clauses, and into some other uh, aspects of the language. Again, as I said earlier on, this is what enables you to produce eventually, or to become fluent in the language, to become fluent in the language, fluent in listening, fluent in reading, and also fluent in speaking, and also fluent in writing as well. Bagian terakhir, <clears throat> the last bit is how. How to teach listening. Yeah, later, Bu Ifon will help you a great deal uh, in terms of how we can make use of technology, a wide variety of applications that can be used to help the students to enjoy the uh, process of learning how to listen in the language. Ada dua cara. Yang pertama namanya adalah teaching listening as comprehension. Yang kedua adalah teaching listening as acquisition. Yeah, they are related, but they are important in different ways. One is teaching listening as comprehension. The other one is teaching listening as acquisition. Okay, when you teach listening for comprehension, I think what you need to do is to help the students to be more, uh, you know, more capable in processing uh, language at the uh, perception level. You may be teaching sound contrast, for example, in the classroom. Yeah, thin and tin are two different sounds in the English language. So this may be an important part of your lesson. Uh, you may be teaching word boundary, for example. You read uh, a paragraph at normal speed, and you just ask the students to count the number of words. Yeah, word boundary. Uh, sound blending, for example, that can also be the focus of your teaching, usually uh, done at the beginning, at the uh, warm-up uh, phase of your lesson. Sound blending, for example, isn't it, becomes in it. It's very common, you know, when people speak fast, you know, isn't it becomes in it. And then some speed training as well. Yeah, maybe you ask the students to listen uh, at a slightly below normal speed, and then gradually increase the speed as you go along. So these are things that you may want to include in 
your teaching if your focus is on teaching listening as comprehension it's a good thing uh, this is often called uh, intensive listening if you like and sometimes you may also uh, these are some additional examples of you know sound blending that you may also want to be teaching a simulation 10 people becomes 10 people 10 cars becomes often when you speak fast it becomes 10 cars isn't it in it next spring uh, next spring went in becomes went in made out becomes may doubt resyllabication happens here reduction going to gonna must have uh, must have and things like that so these are areas that you may want to uh, spend a bit more time with your students uh, helping them for a focused listening instruction uh, to help the students to improve on the ability to distinguish the perceived sounds in the English language. Another aspect that you want to focus on when you look at the teaching of listening as comprehension is for you to be teaching some skills and some cognitive or metacognitive strategies. Again, the past 20 years, we have seen a lot of research in this area, and I think we learned something useful as well. Always, always very important, for example, before the listening begins, students is given an opportunity to set their purpose for listening. Listening is a purposeful activity. Reading is also a purposeful activity. Any act of communication is a purposeful activity. So you listen because you have a purpose. Yeah. So make sure that you have the students. Focus listening. That is another important thing. Students can't be expected to understand everything, but you can ask students to focus on, you know, the main ideas maybe, or some of the controversial ideas that were presented in the spoken text. Monitoring, that's another important metacognitive skill. Yeah. Ask the students to monitor their own comp comprehension and also to evaluate, to assess their comprehension at the end of it. If they don't understand, tell them what they need to do in order to re-listen, uh, to listen again, and also to uh, do it with greater comprehension. Now, these are things that we may want to include in our <laughs> lesson. Now, typically, this is what it looks like. Yeah. A typical lesson based on the uh, uh, approach for teaching listening as comprehension looks a bit like this. Three phases, the before, the during, and the after. The before usually involves some warm-up activity, you know, some problem sounds may be highlighted for teaching, and some strategies or skills may be taught to the students. And then students you know, do the listening, maybe once, maybe two times. And finally, the happiest moment for the teachers is this comprehension exercises. You know, ask students questions to check their comprehension. And this is often followed by discussion of students' problems. Very, very typical. I have nothing against this. This is good. Please continue doing this. But Doing this alone is not enough. If you only do this, it's only maybe a quarter uh, of the battle. You need to work harder. You need to give students. Uh, you need to teach students. You need to prepare students to be able to listen to the language with greater comprehension by paying attention to the other aspect. This is known as listening as acquisition. Listening in order to improve their overall listening ability so that eventually with improved listening ability their overall english language proficiency in particular speaking proficiency will also improve ya yeah, agak beda ya yang pertama tadi hanya fokusnya pada listening comprehension that's it listening comprehension when the lesson ends that's it but listening for acquisition has more to do with helping students to grow their cognitive map their linguistic system so that their listening improves and also their ability to speak, to use the language for communication also uh, improve. Now, how do we do that? <clears throat> There's no other way. This is what we have to do. If you want to improve your overall listening fluency and listening proficiency, 
The only way you can improve on your listening is by listening. There's no other way. You have to do a lot of listening. The amount of listening is important and the frequency of listening also matters. Yeah, in a typical one semester listening uh, course, for example, how many times or how much time the students spend actually listening to the language? If we see Anna, tolong dijawab. In a typical one semester listening course, how much listening and how often the students do the listening in one semester course, typically, based on your lessons in the classroom? I think for informal listening mm. practices. No, uh, formal, formal, the classroom. Oh, yeah. Formal. Yeah, mm. not informal. Well, only uh, less than half mm. of a class uh, yes. hours, I mean. Yeah. Yes, setengah jam dikali. Setengah jam kali berapa? Selama <laughs> satu semester. Well, <laughs> give and take maybe 30 hours. And that is already very, very, uh, you know, substantial. 30 jam mendengarkan. Selama satu semester, kurang lebih begitu. Do you expect your students to be able to become good listeners? The answer is no. There's no way. There's no way you can become good listeners. English, yeah? You know, after 30 hours of listening in your typical, uh, you know, one semester long listening uh, listening course. Tidak bisa. So the amount is important. The frequency is important. Give and take unit one year. Give and take every day half an hour. Selama 365 hari. Berarti kurang lebih 150 jam begitu. The more, the merrier. If you can spend one hour listening or viewing every day for one whole year, I think your listening will improve a great deal. Keep in mind though, it's not just any kind of listening. Bahkan saya tiap hari dengerin gitu loh, dengerin radio, dengerin TV dan sebagainya. And my listening comprehension does not improve. This is the key thing. The last one is the listening materials will have to be interesting, enjoyable, and uh, compelling. Compelling means you really, really like it. You really, really enjoy it. And you understand what you're listening to very, very much. Okay? <clears throat> Aplikasi di kelas itu kurang lebih seperti ini. When you try to apply this idea in your teaching, now your lesson will have to be revised. Your lesson will have to be expanded so that the students have a lot more opportunity to do the listening in the classroom. Kalau biasanya itu satu pelajaran satu jam, mahasiswa cuma kesempatan mendengarkan 10 menit, I think you need to double it or you need to triple it so that the students get a lot more opportunity to listen. The first part is probably the same. Warm up, more importantly, Try to get your students to be really, really excited, interested, and feel curious about the listening materials. It has to be something that is so interesting. Otherwise, the students will not be listening. They will just be listening, but they're not paying attention, actually. They're not excited. Number two, the middle one. Ini. The middle one. You need to anticipate the kind of problems that your students have. If you have to, if you need to slow down the speed at 90% the normal rate, at 80% the normal rate, and maybe gradually you can ask the students to listen again, but at the uh, normal rate of 100% uh, speech rate. If the students still have difficulty, give them this opportunity. Have the subtitle on. I think that is something that is very often missing. Allow the students to see the words on the screen. Some teachers are worried that this is not very authentic. Katanya begitu. Ini tidak baik, Pak. Ini tidak authentic begitu. Who said that? Itu dijewer telinganya. I think you need to jewer those people who said that this is not authentic. This is a very authentic way of learning the language. Yeah. And in the middle part, make sure that you have that you provide students with a lot more opportunities for the students to listen again and again and again, maybe three times, maybe four times, and so on and so forth. So in the listening classroom, students have to listen more, not to do other work related to listening. The listening itself is important. Remember, people learn to listen by 
listening. Ya. Terus yang bagian terakhir, if you can stay away from the traditional comprehension questions. Occasionally that's okay. Yeah, from time to time you can make use of the usual listening comprehension questions for the students to respond to. But those questions are usually very, very boring. The students don't find uh, the exercise enjoyable. And anything that is not enjoyable is detrimental to learning. I think you need to find different ways of assessing comprehension. Uh, I think Buifan, Buifan, are you there? Buifan is preparing a number of very interesting comprehension uh, check or exercises, including uh, you know, how to turn a listening comprehension materials into a poem, for example, using some application. Uh, so these different ways of assessing comprehension include asking students to do a mind map, graphical representation of their understanding. They can draw, they can create animation using some applications, for example. You can act out. You, they can do a blog. They can do a vlog as well. So make use of anything that your students find interesting. The reason is that if the students are interested, if the students are excited, they will spend more time listening on their own after the lesson is over. You can also ask the students to read and speak along with or without the subtitle. Yeah. Now this is called shadowing and I'll explain to you a bit more about shadowing uh, in my next slide. What is important here is this, when the lesson is over, make sure that you allow students, encourage, motivate your students to listen more outside the classroom. Remember, listening develops as a result of doing a lot more listening. Now, here is an example of what is known as a shadowing technique, extremely powerful technique for learning a language through listening shadowing. Uh, later tonight, if you uh, do a Google search, uh, try finding out what polyglots do. Polyglots. Polyglots are people who are very proficient in three, four, five, maybe 10 languages. These are very, very fluent speakers of multiple languages. And you will find that this is one of the must know or must do technique for developing proficiency in learning a new language. Usually the procedure looks like this. Yeah. First you listen, just listen, listen for understanding. Yeah. If you still don't understand very much, then listen again with the subtitle on until you are really, really uh, able to understand what the spoken text is about. And then you listen again and read along. As you listen, you read together. You say it together with the speaker. You do it again, maybe two times, maybe three times. And you may want to use the transcript if necessary. So that is what shadowing is all about. It's like singing. Uh, the, uh, you know, when you practice singing, you turn on the music and you sing along basically, like karaoke style of learning how to sing. The same process. Now, apparently this is a very useful, a very powerful uh, technique for improving on your listening. Finally, as I said earlier on, uh, listening lessons in the classroom, if you spend only 30 hours of listening after one whole year, that is not enough. You will never be able to develop fluency in listening and you will never be able to develop your ability to speak, to use the language or to acquire those ready-made uh, utterances that I mentioned earlier on. So how do you listen beyond the classroom? The first thing that people ask is, where do I find the materials? Di mana dong bahan-bahannya? What materials are available for me so that I can listen with understanding? The key thing, listen with understanding. And there's a website like this one, E-L-L-L-O. It has hundreds, thousands of very interesting listening and video materials as well. And you can choose which one you want to listen to depending on the uh, level of difficulty and depending on your interest. So what I'm saying here is there's no excuse for you to say that I can't find the materials. It's a lot of materials, even from YouTube. 
you will be able to find a lot of interesting uh, materials. The key thing, again, you have to understand. If you don't understand very much, no point. I mean, it's still useful. You learn something from it, but from a language learning perspective, not very useful. You have to understand every single word that the person is saying so that after you finish listening, you remember the idea, the content, and you remember at least some of the words and some of the way the uh, speaker is uh, expressing their ideas in speech. Here's another one. I don't know if you have uh, Netflix at home, but I do have Netflix at home. In the past, you have to turn on the TV, buy DVD and things like that. Nowadays, you don't. Netflix has thousands of very interesting movies, uh, very interesting uh, you know, uh, TV series that are available. Extremely useful, extremely powerful to improve on uh, your listening when you do spend time practicing listening outside the classroom. Uh, at this point, let me show you, I'm about, uh, you know, I'm approaching the end of my presentation. I'm going to share with you a very interesting, let me just uh, turn on the audio. A very interesting experience of, you know, uh, a group band member from Korea. I think this is from BTS. I think many of you, the young people have heard about BTS. Now let's listen very carefully about uh, one or the leader of the group, yeah? Okay, very brief. We're back with BTS, and first of all, let's have introductions. Introduce yourselves, please. Hi, nice to meet you. My name is RM. I'm the leader of this crew and kind of like a spokesperson. I think people are crazy about BTS. I think you know that. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. I need one, but you actually are. Okay, so they're all very good looking young men, yeah? That's why, you know, teenagers are crazy about them. What is important for today is what the group leader is saying. Name is Kim Nam Jun or something like you that. You speak English, right? Yes. So pretty well. You taught yourself English? Yes, I, I taught myself English. How did, how did you teach yourself English? Um, actually, my English teacher was a sitcom, Friends. Oh, you yes, watch Friends? Legible. Yes. So it, was it mainly just fra just phrases then, or you just learned everything? Um, I think, you know, back in the days, like when I was like 15, uh -huh. like 14, yeah. it was quite like a syndrome for all the Korean parents to make their kids watch the, the Friends. Really? So yeah, for, I thought I was kind of like a victim at that time, but. Uh <laughs> But right now I'm, I'm the lucky one. Yeah. So yeah. Like thanks to my mother, she she bought the, all the all the seasons for the DVDs. Uh huh. It's, it's it got ten DVDs, right? Right. She bought she bought me, and so firstly I watched with the Korean subtitle, and then next time I watched with the English subtitle, and then I just removed it. That's very impressive, and friends would be very happy that. Okay. Now what is important is this. That you learn. This is how he described his. English learning experience through watching a TV series called Friends. It has, back then it has 10 uh, DVD. 10 means 10 seasons. And each season has maybe 20 episodes. The Rilima Kali, is like 100 uh, movies about Friends. And this is how he learned. First, he did not really understand the language very well. Here, subtitle on. Subtitle is good because it helps you understand what you're listening to and what you're watching. And then I watch with the English subtitle. Ah, interesting, yeah? It is step number two. And step number three adalah, and then I removed it. And this gets repeated again and again, I don't know until how long, until he became very fluent in the English language. The other band members, do you think they speak English, Bulefti? The other band members, do you think they speak English? Not much, I guess, but. Bo yeah, Boika, do, do you think they speak English? The other band members, 
very no. very little they can just say hello i'm the handsome i'm the most handsome in the world that's all nothing else it's it's the band leader who is very very capable of you know uh, using english as a result of doing a lot of listening and this is the uh, tv series called friends that he watched like 